Christmas cards. <coughs> you guys did very good in filling these out. I'm going to be sharing these with you over the next few weeks. question for you. Which one was easier? To fill out, I know Jesus loves me because, or I know I have the joy of the Lord because? Okay? Sometimes you have to actually look on paper and really think of how you're going to express this. How do you really know that God loves you? You can read it from Scripture, you can hear it told from the pulpit, but if you are not able to express it yourself and figure out a way to either say it or write it, then how do you really know that God really loves you? And if God loves you and you're a follower of His, Jesus promises you joy. Is that right? Amen. But there are many Christians who have no joy. And you have to ask yourself, why? And how can that be? If God lives inside of you through the power of His Holy Spirit, and God gives you joy, and you have no joy, then what does that mean? How can you come and belong to a church and get very tied up with the activities of the church, but still find no joy and no peace? No happiness. Something is missing. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13. <coughs> Are you familiar with this chapter? It's a love chapter. Every wedding that I've participated in pretty much had 1 Corinthians 13 spoken in some form or way. But is this chapter only for newlyweds? Is this chapter only for those about to commit themselves to a lifelong unity? This chapter explains how God views you, and it also tells you how you can have and live in this world of sin and still be a follower of Christ, because this is what you will have. You will have this love. Now, the love that's in 1 Corinthians 13, what kind of love is that? So, if it's agape love, is it something we can produce in our own strength or from our own merits? It's a gift from God. Jesus said for you to love your enemies. Raise your hand if you love your enemies. Can it be done? Yes. But it can only be done through God. Because loving your enemy is not natural to us. Is that right? Okay, so Jesus tells us all these things. But he didn't say it so that we can figure out, well, how am I supposed to do this? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding like a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. What does that mean? That means if you don't have love, you just make a lot of noise, right? And that's what everybody will hear is just a lot of noise. Because you can say, I love you, but if your actions don't back that up, then what is it? A lot of noise, right? And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, I am what? Nothing. So understand what Paul's talking about here is a spiritual realm. I can say that I love God 
that I follow God, that I'm a leader that God placed here, but if I don't have love in my heart, it means nothing. On the leadership side. Now, on the membership side, you can come here week after week and say, I love God, but not like the person sitting next to you. What does that mean? You're just making a lot of noise, and it means absolutely nothing. Brothers and sisters, when Christ called you into this family and into this house of worship, He called you to love the person sitting next to you and in every pew behind you and in front of you and on the side of you. We do not have the choice to pick and choose who we like and who we don't like. Now let me ask you, how many of you come from a family? Raise your hand. <laughs> it should be everybody, right? I've got a reason to ask this question. <laughs> Now, all you raised your hand because everybody's come from some type of family. How many of you have come from a family that never had a quarrel or an argument or a disagreement within that family? Raise your hand. I'm looking. So why do you think you're going to join a church family and never have an argument, a quarrel, or a disagreement with somebody that's sitting next to you? Okay? This is a family. Now, when you joined the church, and if you were baptized, when you went into that water, did that water magically take away your sinful nature? No. So you still got a church full of people with fallen sinful natures, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And you expect that you'll always get along? That you'll see everything eye to eye? Well, that's good. You're all saying, no, you don't expect it. Then why is it when it doesn't happen? that you get so upset that you don't want to talk to the person sitting next to you. Or, worst case scenario, you leave the fellowship. We speak about love. It's really easy to talk about. But living it out day to day is not that easy, is it? The Bible says that love covers what? A multitude of sins. What does that mean within the church family and the church setting? Does that mean that I'm going to cover the sins of an adulterer? No. no. But it means if my brother or my sister offends me because of something they've said or done, that I am required. <coughs> Is that what that word means, required? To show grace, to show mercy, and to show forgiveness. Because the Bible also says that Though love covers a multitude of sins, if you do not forgive your brother, then what happens? God will also not forgive you. And if you hold hate or ought against your brother in your heart, don't bother placing your gift in the little tray there because it's going to profit you nothing. Because God is not going to hear your prayers. Right? Now, Within the family construct, I have met, talked, counseled with many within a family who have not spoken to each other in decades. Younger ones in days or weeks or months. Can you imagine not talking to your brother or your sister or your father or your mother for decades? That's life, right? Those things happen. They happen. Sometimes there's good reason for not talking to those people. But, is that what God intended? Is that what the family is supposed to be for? To the place for a battleground to happen? The family in the home is supposed to be your refuge, your slice of heaven, that you escape the world and escape all of the negativeness, all of the pain to be able to come into a group of people who love you, who accept you, and who are there for you. They have your back. Now, isn't the church family supposed to be the same way? <laughs> though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me what? Nothing. Can you imagine 
suffering a martyr's death but having no love in your heart and that it profits you nothing? I've always read that verse and said, I don't think that could happen. But it's there and it's in writing, so apparently it can, right? Listen. No matter how high his profession, he whose heart is not imbued with love for God and for his fellow man is not a disciple of Christ. Though he should possess great faith and even have power to work miracles, yet without love, his faith would be worthless. He might display great liberality, but should he, from some other motive than genuine love, bestow all his goods to feed the poor, the act would not commend him to the favor of God. In his zeal, he might even meet a martyr's death. Yet if destitute of the gold of love, he would be regarded by God as a deluded enthusiast or an ambitious hypocrite. Those are powerful words. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. Discord and strife are the work of the devil and the fruit of sin. If we would, as a people, enjoy peace and love, we must put away our sins. We must come into harmony with God, and we shall be in harmony with one another. Let each ask himself, do I possess the grace of love? Have I learned to suffer long and to be kind? Talents, learning, and eloquence without this heavenly attribute will be as meaningless as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Alas, that this precious treasure is so lightly valued and so little sought by many who profess the Christian faith. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Well, what kind of love, Paul, are you talking about? What does it look like? Unconditional. I like that. Love suffers what? Love. Love, love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. <clears throat> what does it mean, love does not parade itself? You guys figured that one out? Ego? Thought what you said? I like that. Janet? There are those in our world that uh, blow themselves up and other people, and they think they're martyrs and they're doing a great thing. It sounds like celebrities for today. <coughs> <laughs> Let a tragedy happen and see the celebrities pop up, and as soon as they get their FaceTime on camera, where do they go? Okay? Listen. Paul shows us here what this love is like, what this love and how it's supposed to be lived, what it means to give and to receive this kind of love. Love suffers long. It is kind. Does not envy. Does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. This kind of love is not ego driven. It is not selfish. This kind of love is selfless. This is God's love. This is agape. And it comes from God and flows through God. But you know what? God lives in you. And you have this love love available to you. Does not the Christ live in you? Did not Jesus die so that he could live inside of you? Amen. Have you ever thought about that? The Christ, the anointed one, lives in you. What does that mean? That means you have become his body. You have become his hands, his feet, his mouth. That if the Christ is living in you, then the character that you should have is the character of the Christ that lives in you. And within the framework of the church, we are to love each other so much that the world looks at you and I in the church here 
and goes, I want to be a part of that. Look at how they love one another. You're called to love the world, but do you realize you're called to love your brothers and sisters in the church more and in a different way? If you can't get along with me, and if I can't get along with you, how do you ever expect to get along with them? It never happened. Okay? Love does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. I love this one. Love thinks what? No evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. And love will endure all things. This is why this is so popular at weddings. Because that couple that's standing there about to get married, do they have an inkling or a clue what they're getting into? <laughs> How many here have been married for five years or less? Raise your hand. Look around, look around, because nobody's raised their hand. Five years or less, nobody's raised their hand. How many have been married ten years or less? Raise your hand. Okay, we got one person, 10 years or less. How many have been married 20 years or less? Raise your hand. Okay, that's a lot. How many have been married 30, 30 years or less? Raise your hand. That would be 25 if you were married 25 years and up to 30. Okay? How many have been married 50 years? Anybody? So those of you who have been married like 30 years and down, and you look at the people that are coming to stand and say their vows together. Do they have a clue what is in front of them and what's facing no. them? No. Right? Why do you think it says love is patient, love is kind, love endures all things? Because brothers and sisters, is this life easy? No. Does getting married make it any easier? No. If you're single, you're going to say, yes, it does. <laughs> if you're married, you're going to say, oh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> I heard you, Luke. <laughs> so do we. It all depends on your perspective. It does because now you have one other person who shares everything you go through. Yeah. But let's say you don't see eye to eye. And that person isn't a helpmate for you. How many marriages do you know have become prison cells? Mm -hmm. You think they're thinking that uh, marriage is so great? This is the human condition. The choices are yours. You get in what you, or you'll get out what you put in. And uh, the person that you see there standing before you at the altar. Sometimes it's not the person you get after you say, I do. Is that right? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't think evil. Love looks out for the betterment of the other person. That's what a real marriage is about. That's what everybody is looking for. But that's, what, that's not what most people find. This is why God in your life and in your relationship is so important. Is that right? Mm -hmm. But just because you come to church and you can be the pastor or the head elder, head deacon, and you profess you love God, does that really mean you love God? No. Does abuse happen in the confines of the church? Yes. Mm -hmm. So depending on what's in your heart, you can make big claims, but it will come out, and it will be seen, and you can only hide it so long. Whether you have righteousness and God living there, or whether you have the devil living there. You only have two fathers. You're either going to have God as your father, or you're going to have Satan as your father. You're either going to be God's child, or you're going to be the devil's child. The choice is yours.
Yeah. <clears throat> Love does not behave rudely. Don't you wish Paul put some type of but in there? <laughs> Love is kind, but if she's not that nice to you, well, then you don't have to be that nice to you. <laughs> Love is not but. But he doesn't put that in there. Right? Why is that? Because you, as an individual, do not base your love on the reaction you're getting from the other person. Amen. The love comes out of you because love is inside of you. And if God is inside of you, that's the only thing that can come out of you. Amen. Now listen. Make sure you're clear on this. We all still have fallen natures. Is that right? Amen. Bob, do you mind if I pick on you for a minute? Go ahead. Thank you. You're a good man. <laughs> you never have you never have any disagreements with Marilyn, do you? Once in a while. Marilyn, everything that Bob says is right and correct. Is that true? <laughs> found a way to work through your disagreements, is that right? Yes. Bob, do you love her? What's that? Do you love her? Sure. Marilyn, do you love him? Yes. And how long have you guys been together? Forty, almost forty-one years. That's a long time, isn't it? Yes. Now, Max, you're about to get married, is that right? Do you mind if I pick on you for a minute? Do you love Tara? Yes, I do. She love you? Absolutely. Okay, now, do you think there's a difference in the kind of love that Max is talking about than what Bob and Mary would have? No. Yes. 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 I would tell you yes. Why? Because it's been through 40 years of maturity. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, there's nothing wrong with the love that Max and Tara had. Because when Bob and Marilyn first met, they had that same kind of love. Yeah. Yeah. But, listen, and I've said this before, I want you to think about this. Do you guys remember when you really first fell in love? Okay, I mean that first, that's all you thought about, falling in love kind of thing, where you didn't care whether you ate or whether you drank or whether you listened to your mom and dad or anybody else, all you wanted to do was be around that person and your thoughts were on that person pretty much the whole time you might even dreamt about them when you were sleeping. Remember that love? Okay, now, if you were to go, oh, 10 years into the future, do you think your feelings would be that strong still? a different type of love, right? The first thing is infatuation. I'm so infatuated with you. I just want to be with you the, all the time that we have. Is that really true deep love? Okay? True love is the love that after 40 years is still there. Now here's the difference. You go into a restaurant. Bob and Marilyn are there. They're eating their food. They may not be saying anything to each other, and it's been that way for the last 20 minutes. Okay? Max and Tara go in there, and they haven't shut up since they got into the restaurant. <laughs> the couple sitting over here look at both of them and, and say to each other, man, I, I, I hope we never get to that point. I hope we always stay at that point. Once you've been through it, I'd rather be able to enjoy the silence and not deal with the uncomfortableness of the silence. You understand what I'm saying? That's love. Love, and, and believe me, I've had this talk with this one gentleman over and over and over for the last five, six years. Love is a commitment. When Jesus said he loves you, he showed it through a commitment that took him all the way to the cross. Jesus could have said, I love you. But I'm not going there, so we'll see you. I love you. Okay? But Jesus showed that love by going all the way to the cross. The innocent dying for the guilty. I have been married now for 26 years. And two days before my wedding, I had to sit down with my brother because he was the only one I knew that was married for as long as what he was married for. And I asked him. How do you 
stay with one person for the rest of your life. Because that's a long time. It's like, don't you get like tired of each other? Because I had girlfriends before, and after like a year or two, all you did was argue and fight, and you were just tired of that. But I loved them, and I wanted to be around them when I first met them, you know what I'm saying? And that's all I thought about. I was infatuated. But there was no commitment there. Because when things started to go south, I went north. <laughs> You guys understand the difference of what I'm talking about? Yeah. Commitment. This man told me, it's all you talk about is commitment. Love isn't commitment, love is a feeling. He said, if love is a feeling, you love her today, and the first time she gets you really upset, tell me how you feel. And then tell me if that's love. But true love says, you've got me upset, I may need to go for a walk, but I will be back. And I will always be back. And I will never leave you, no matter what happens, no matter what we face or what we do, I am always there for you. Now let me ask you a question, those of you who are married, been married for a long time, do you always like your spouse? No. 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 Isn't it the same thing with your kids? I love my kids, but there are days I just don't like them. <laughs> and my kids said the same thing about me, so don't worry. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mutual feeling. That's the human experience, right? This is what God does for you. God allows you to go through all of these human emotions and still have that loving commitment that you will be there no matter what. What's the divorce rate within the church? Is that it? It's the same as it is outside the church. Do you guys realize that? The divorce rate within the church is the same as it is in the outside the church. What's that telling us? That's telling us that we say we believe the Bible. We say we talk about it. But when it comes to actually putting it into practice, yeah, it could be a different story. Right? Listen, what does God want from us? He wants you.